I'm Jan Worm and we're in my studio in Berkeley right now and I'm very happy that Wendy Martin is here with me today and that we'll be having a conversation about art, life, the creative life, mm -hmm. um, women in contemporary society and anything else that crosses our minds and our, um, our day today. Yeah. Interestingly, I, I used to um, live and work in Manhattan, as you know, and I spent a lot of time on the subways. And I remember thinking in the early days of uh, the smartphone and I, iPods and so forth, um, well, I'll watch, I'll watch the cars and see when there's a shift. I mean, right now, most people are reading print. They're still reading books and newspapers. And uh, when will that take place? And it took a while, uh, but uh, before people started to look like this, just fiercely concentrating on their, on their uh, device, whatever it was, whether it's an iPad or, or um, you know, smartphone or whatever. And now it's the, the figure ground has changed completely and, and there are many, many more electronic devices and rarely a book. You know, and that happened maybe in 10, I would say 10 years. Also notice that in airports, the same change. Yes. Yeah, uh, I hadn't fully, haven't really fully taken in the social isolation that comes with it. Or let's put it this way, it's not social isolation, is it really because there's an intense social interaction with the whatever's going on with the machine. Um, uh, but the lack of uh, engagement with your immediate environment doesn't matter. And I do it all the time too, I'm kind of shocked. I will actually be walking along doing email and stop for something important and, and stand on the side of the, uh, in the sidewalk or side of the street finishing whatever it is. I have no idea where I am. I really could be anywhere. So I suppose this is the way of the future. I mean, I, I don't know what that does for visual experience though, because, you know, there's a, someone who loves public transportation, what I loved about it was the, as we say, used to say, people watching. Mm -hmm. I don't know if people watch people anymore. It's an interesting, so what does that do, I think, for one's sense of a visual environment? I mean, um, it occurs to me we really need artists like you to kind of bring us back in some way to um, the world, you know, the world around us trying to know, trying to be part of it. I mean, if it doesn't happen every day, it's got to happen sometime. So maybe it's maybe this will be the function of one of the important functions of art. I mean, not only nuancing what you see, and but I mean literally at the most basic level, bringing back, you know, bringing people back to the to the visual realm. Well, this brings up so many interesting um, points because um, you know this issue of what happens when your visual education is on a screen it's always flat, when everything is always um, brought to the same scale. You have no sense of scale. It's all brought to the same size. So you lose scale. And it's yeah. always illuminated in the same way. It yeah. has a chromatic scale that is, um, you know, unrealistic or undifferentiated from um, how we experience things in real life, where we're going from one palette to another, light changes things, we have texture, we have so many different elements that enter into our visual experience yeah. as opposed to this this flat, um, illuminated screen that, that's always there and that um, recalibrates everything for us. Yeah. So it, it's going to be interesting to see how um, things develop in the future. Well, you have a whole generation where um, that's the experience, a, a social experience of, mm -hmm. of visual worlds and visual language. Yeah. Uh, certainly, you know, you're not going to have people who stop looking at things from the past. There'll always be a segment of the population that does that. But that's yeah. not the majority of people. That's yeah. not what becomes the, um, the common visual language yeah. at all. Yeah. Um, and, and, and that's very interesting. And also, um, you know, we, we talk about the difference in the museum going experience now because everyone has their phones and they're spending more time taking pictures of themselves with the artwork mm -hmm. or 
looking at something or listening to a guide or having something on their their device than they are interacting with the artwork and seeing what it gives them and what they can take from it and what um, how, how expansive their experience and their ideas can be and, yeah. and interacting, much less talking to another museum goer. I mean, to talk to somebody who is not part of your party, if you came with someone, about the art that you're looking at has become a very rare experience. Mm -hmm. To have the ability to sit on a bench and then just talk casually with someone about mm -hmm. the artwork, mm -hmm. or just to know that you two are both looking at this work and exchange some kind of recognition or smile or yeah. any kind of exchange is pretty much a thing of the past yeah, with true. how we're we're going yeah. through museums yeah, today. That's true. And yeah. you know, just the same thing, when you walked in, the first thing you did was you pointed to a book that I had there and you said, oh, you're reading this too and you know, conversation ensues. To be on BART and see somebody reading a book that you've read or haven't read and is that good and have a conversation which everyone was open to in the past. Yeah, yeah. And it was really a, a form of expanding our experience of the reading mm -hmm. and of, of you know, who we are as, you yeah. know, as, a, as a city, as an, you know, a state, a country. And, you know, um, it was very yeah. natural and organic, yeah. which I think is why um, you know, some cities have had like what Seattle is reading one book, and then everyone has something to talk, talk about, about. Right, right. Which is you know a, a, a really great idea when it doesn't happen organically in our mm -hmm. daily lives anymore. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But, um, that's, that's, so that a certain dimension of spontaneous interaction in in public spaces is diminishing is is definitely uh, less less obvious at least than it once was or less frequent. It's, it's, see, I have to, really, I think I'm gonna start noticing really carefully because one of my favorite things is to go in, in a, a city, a city like Manhattan, it's just the casual exchanges you have with people in the elevator. Or, I don't know, someone opens a door for you, you open a door for them, or you know, there's something in the window that, it, 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 you just never know when someone might just make a very funny, comment and you're there in the same space and you laugh or whatever. I, I, I used to happen a lot and I, that was one of my favorite things about being in the city is that, you know, these momentary exchanges gone, you never see the person again, they never see you, but it gave your your life a little lift. A little, of course, yeah, of course. A little brightness, I, yeah. I, I think that's what's really um, a very um, important element that we don't recognize is that those kinds of encounters do in fact make us feel connected mm -hmm. and when we don't have them I think it feeds into a sense of isolation that a lot of people have mm -hmm. so you know in, in terms of my own work I'm very interested in in communication and and miscommunication also and in what is being um, you know signaled by body language mm -hmm. so when you talk about these figures that are all in space, they're all trying to be articulate with their bodies, or I'm trying to make them articulate yeah. with their bodies and yeah. with how they occupy space, how they either shrink or expand out mm -hmm. to the edges. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and all those things are changing all the time. Mm -hmm. Just as, you know, um, clothing and dress, we, we have had decades where people wore patterned clothing and we have periods where they didn't and all mm -hmm. of that has a kind of of meaning too, yeah, and um, you know, more form fitting or less form fitting. Or if you were to take painting, say one of your paintings from, I don't know, we'll say thirty years ago, uh, and have you have you ever done this where you've taken say a painting for each decade and put them next to each other on a wall so you could see what the what the um, stylistic changes were? Not not only what you do with the the material, but what was the material you were working with in the mm -hmm. first place in terms of the way the clothes looked or the hairstyles? Or would you would there be much of a change, say, over a thirty-year period? Um, well, I think everyone wants their retrospective. Yeah, <laughs> they yeah, want to yeah. be able to do and see all of that that's together. That's right. That's um, right. I, you know, I haven't had that thrill of being able to like sit and look and actually process all of that which I think would be really fun but I've been able to do it um, with 
you know, photographically with images, with print, and mm -hmm. I've been able to put things together in books and, and kind of look at them that way. Um, so for me, the kinds of changes that I'm seeing have more to do with, um, you know, early work being very impostered and thick and built up and, and agitated brushstroke and then thinning out and getting very, very oh. minimal and, and using a lot of um, turpentine with spirits, white spirits of turpent and, and, and really having thin, um, mm. a, a, a very thin um, surface. Uh, drawing coming in in a different way, actually physically drawing into the, the paintings with oil pastels. Um, palette change. I know I lived in London for three years and that affected what I was seeing, mm -hmm. how light was, everything became, yeah. um, you know, I was working with tertiary colors <laughs> instead uh, of primary colors. Uh -huh. um, then it kind of built up again. Then it became highly layered. I was after, for about 20 years, I was working after sort of, I wanted to have stream of consciousness in the paintings. And I just built up layer after layer after layer, going through time on these people and what they were thinking until you couldn't see. And I had no memory of what the underlying um, image had been to begin with. And everything grayed out. Nearly 20 years, all my paintings were gray. And mm -hmm. then, you know, I was looking at old work. Somebody was like, moving old work of mine and started talking about it with me and suddenly you know these multiple images disappeared the color came back you know hmm. I was like painting myself again but I wasn't just painting my old paintings they were different they came back in a different form sort of the way um, my mother's red and white polka dot dress came back differently 20 years mm -hmm. later. I mean, it was like the same red and white polka dot dress that I was wearing. And she said, oh, I had that 20 years ago, but it was slightly different. So the hem mm -hmm. length is different and the collar yeah. is a different fabric, doesn't have the sheen. Of, and, and those kinds of changes come up. Was that, now are the, when those changes happen, are they conscious or do you just see them after the fact? Oh, I think they're, they're conscious, they're deliberate. They're going after something different. I wanna mm -hmm. do this, but I wanna make it like look this way. Or I want this, but it, I want it. Um, mm -hmm. I want it. I want all that stuff that was on the surface to be underpainting. Mm -hmm. So even though it looks like a really smooth skin, actually underneath that kind of solid pink that you've got there, yeah. there's you know there's green and blue and gray uh -huh. and red and uh -huh. purples under uh -huh. there. They're just uh -huh. you know it's underpainting. And uh -huh. then if you if you kind of look at it, it has a feel that comes through in some places, not everywhere. Uh -huh. So, so you know, one one year I'm working this way, and one year I'm working that way, and pushing it away from yeah. me. But uh, I'm still engaged with certain um, certain principles. But then, for example, you said some years you had a very thick, um, mm -hmm. uh, textured kind of uh, surface, and then others uh, other times it became very attenuated and thinned out with spirits of turpentine, whatever. What, when those kinds of major shifts are taking place, or, or you know, is are you signaling? What would you say you're signaling with the very thick textured um, surface compared to something thinner and more, more as I said, attenuated? Is there? Yeah. You think that, is there a mood you're trying to convey, or is it a, a, a feeling that you have about what you're seeing and? how you feel in the world at the time. Oh, sure. Yeah. I, you know, I, I think when, when everything is built up and solid and it feels, you know, very sculptural here, it's right here, it's solid, um, it's, it's got a form, we can, we can like kind of like put our hands into it, we wow. want to like scrape it off, we want to eat the paint, you know, uh -huh. it's like really present. It has a certain power and presence. And when it's, um, when it's thinning out, it um, places us in a more precarious, tenuous position, and we're looking at things with a sense of some fragility or uncertainty. Uh, we question things. Mm. Um, it is more demanding, I think, of the viewer to, um, to go in and ask, what is there? What is this about in a different way? I yeah. think the, the other then asserts itself uh, and makes a pronouncement that's very different and keeps the viewer at a different distance. I think all of these 
uh, are very real differences. Just as you know, I think in the last oh um, fifteen years, at least twenty years, I've been doing a lot more drawing and work on paper, which also because of the scale, it it is saying you know very different things about the world and about the viewer, and when somebody is holding something in their hands they're invited in in a different way and they're engaged in a different mm. way so um now we have know. said some negative things about technology and <laughs> be terrible. you know um, yeah. impact of its way it's it, it, you know its way of seeming to separate people who are sharing a common space but um there are some interesting possibilities and I wonder if you've ever thought or if you've done any work using uh, you know an iPad or uh, a, you know a, a, a portable computer something where you can move take it around move moves with you um, where you've actually there are painting programs and there are ways mm -hmm. you can paint David Hockney there was a mm -hmm. show at, at uh, the De Young and there was one painting I thought was fascinating where it captured you know every phase of the painting because he had done it on the computer so you could see the very first the beginnings and then everything that happened mm -hmm. in the middle and changes he made and then the end and you realized that um, it was a process and every phase of the process is important and you were talking about paintings where you're trying to do almost stream of consciousness and capturing all mm -hmm. the different mm -hmm. moods and nuances but with a canvas Finally, you have to choose something. You know, there is something finally on the work that you may go back to it at a later time, but you hang it on the wall and you show it to people and you say, well, this is it. But everything, is, there's so much that's gone into it. And had I been sitting here watching you paint, I might have said, stop here, stop here, don't touch mm -hmm. this. On the other hand, because I like that, but then I like the changes. So what do you think about that capacity to... Um, capture the many mm -hmm. versions, the variations, mm -hmm. um, all of which or much of which might be extraordinarily wonderful. Mm -hmm. And you'd hate to lose it by the next stroke. Yeah. Well, um, I think all of us as artists, whether we're um, you know, writing or, or making visual art or music, we really love our work. And we love the process. Um, and there was um, an exhibition to go back to the, this this really formative experience um, with with uh, Matisse, and they showed the big pink nude of his, and they had the photographs that were done because um, there was an exhibit in France um, where he had a. a a few paintings and they were photographed along the way and the exhibit included the photographs of it in different stages as oh, he changed yes. and altered the paintings yeah. and um, in fact this recently was recreated with the different paintings and those photographs in France I saw the exhibition in Paris recently but um, but that was the first time that I saw all these paintings from the big pink nude that it had been really transformed and so uh, I, I think um, I was in my first year of graduate school in London at the Royal College of Art and I checked out a video camera and I mm -hmm. set it up on a tripod and, uh -huh. and I wanted to record the painting through all its changes and um, development. Well, it takes a long time to do a painting. Oh, I know, and yeah. I, I have to say that quite honestly it was the most boring thing to look at and there's <laughs> nobody who would want to look at what i thought would be fascinating at this video of painting you know of you know the painting process so when you have something highly edited and and, and it, it's very interesting another person mm -hmm. who has done this and is a marvelous painter um i, I mean just hugely important painter is frank auerbach painter and you look at his portraits and also you might look at like 30 photographs of a portrait and think why didn't he stop here why didn't he stop there this was absolutely marvelous <coughs> and it goes yeah. through um, but there 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 was when I wanted to do these layered paintings um, and this goes back a long time this goes back um, 30 years to when I started doing the, the stream of consciousness I did go in at the time 
you may recall the whole earth access. Yes, yeah. You made a comment, and I guess I want to just ask, you said, well, you did video at one point your, your self-painting. And that it was kind of boring. Well, it's it's you know it's a long process, and and when I started doing these multiple layers, I actually did think that that the computer might be able to give me that opportunity to do this, and so I went in and I was playing around at at these yeah. computers and talking to the the guys there at uh, the whole earth. This goes back thirty years, and at that point, in terms of layering you still did not have opacity. So you had one image over another and wherever the images were, that they, they covered over each other. And I was looking for something, which you can probably do now differently, and I yeah. you know I could, but then there wasn't any programming for that. Um, the software wasn't available to change the opacity of the different layers. So some could be lighter or thicker and you could actually uh -huh. merge images, which is what I was, what I was after. Um, so the, it wasn't available to me at that time. And I did other things. <coughs> I, I did some, um, some monotypes.